Romans, the first chapter. We're going to start at 14, and we're going to read down to 17. Are you walking with me so far? The Bible says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. In, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Father, Guide us through your word today. Open our minds to hear your words, your thoughts, Father. Remove our own thoughts and our minds away from the situation, Father, and give us what you have us to know. Father, there is a, a truth to the fact that we all sin and come short of the glory of God. None of us can stand up here and say that we are perfect. But it's through you, Father, that you have given us salvation which gives us the perfection of life through you and not through ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated under the grace of God. I am simply talk, calling this message today, not ashamed, not ashamed. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, I charge thee therefore uh, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. That's patience, y'all, and doctrine. That's what Paul said. And when Paul wrote this to Timothy, the culture and the world had its own problems that was contrary to God's word. They had a lot of things going on that God was not pleased with. Uh, and I can tell you today, the people and the problems may have changed, but nowadays people are trying to force God's word to fit into their lifestyle, trying to force God's word to fit into their belief system. They're trying to for, for, force God's word to fit into their everyday life, but I promise you that that doesn't work. Because we have to understand that God's word does not change. God does not change. There is a theological word we use called immutable. It means not to change. So God's word doesn't change. Isaiah 40 and 38 says God's word stands forever. First Peter 1 and 25 says the word of the Lord remains forever. Malachi 3 and 6 says, I am the Lord and I do not change. And if all those are the truth, then we have to think that Isaiah 5 and 20 is the truth too, where it says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness. In other words, God doesn't change no matter what we decide is right. God doesn't change what we decide is wrong. You see, what we do in today's society is we have made things that feel good be priority. You see, it feels good to me, so I'm going to go ahead and do that thing. Now, before you start looking and criticizing other folk that you know in your neighborhood and at your house, you got to first look at yourself. Because every last one of us has done the very same thing at some point or another in our lives. Somehow we think that we can point to other sin and think that, hey, you know what, they wrong. Well, you know that old saying, uh, what is it, one and four. Five pointing back or four pointing back. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The truth is, if you're going to look at them, you got to first look at yourself. Because we have all sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. 
And so we have to understand, though, that that is the reason why salvation is important. Salvation is important because that is the only thing that will cover our sins. That is the only thing that will take care of us be from our B.C. life, that is before Christ, y'all, uh, up until right now. Because of the fact that is only the truth. God had to do it if we were going to have life in any kind of way, shape, or form. I may can't tell, I can't tell you what you be doing right now, but I can tell you without salvation, I'd be busting hell wide open once this time of life goes on. If you're honest with yourself, you will know that you would probably be doing the same thing. Joining Pastor Courtney on the magic school bus going right on down to hell without yeah, y'all know. So the, the, that's what we have to understand. We need to understand that the culture, the color, the generation of the people, not the size of the church, the background, not preference of persons, not orientations, should nor could change God's word. Nothing can change it. There is no such thing as us as preachers going up in front of a camera because we want to keep all of our thousands of members and decide that, you know what, we're going to beat around the bush here because I don't want to lose these members that I have so much gain because now I'm talking against them. You have to remember you're not talking against them. You are only giving what God's word is. That is the reason why it's important that we love the right way. You see, because you can give the word and it may be contrary to someone's life or what they may be doing in life, but you can love them and remind them that, baby, I'm still here with you. I'm still, I ain't going nowhere. I still love you. I'm just letting you know what the word of God says. And that is between now you and God. You see, you can still tell the truth about the word without beating around the bush and still love them all at the same time. And if you can't, stop and think about your life. Somebody had to love you out of hell. Somebody had to love you out of hell. Somebody had to pray for you. Yeah, somebody had to pray for you. You see, just because everything is right there in front of you doesn't mean we always take it, do we? Salvation is in front of a lot of people, and a lot of us didn't take it when we first was offered, did we? So stop judging before you look at yourself first. So take a look at the scripture today because there are some things I want you to get today. Number one, I need you to get, uh, uh, I want you to understand that you have to be prepared for the gospel. Prepared for the gospel. Number two, I want you to understand that we need to be proud of the gospel. Proud of the gospel. And then the last thing I want us to get today is to understand the perspective of the gospel. The perspective of the gospel. Take a look at your text today. This is Paul, who is writing to the Roman church. He wrote this letter somewhere around 57 AD to make sure they get it. His idea was that one day he would be going to Rome and even might be uh, spending some time there in Rome. So while he was in a city called Corinth, y'all know the Corinthians, don't you? He wrote this letter with that intention that one day he would get to Rome. But there was a detour because on his progress uh, going through these different places he was arrested this time arrested in Jerusalem you know Paul had that problem because he was sharing the gospel he got arrested you see we don't even want to share the gospel because we think we're going to lose a friend we don't want to share the gospel because we think we're going to lose somebody that, that somebody's not going to like us tomorrow we don't share the gospel because we think that if we share that work then we might get a problem they may not let me borrow their pen uh, when I need one because they're mad with me you see we have all all kinds of reasons of why we don't share the gospel. But here it is, Paul is sharing the gospel, even though he knew that he would be getting arrested. Paul has been arrested. Paul has been beaten. Paul has been
been cussed. Paul has been persecuted. And eventually Paul was killed all because he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are in the place that you can freely share, but you don't want to share the gospel because you think you're going to lose members in your church. You don't want to share the gospel because you think you're going to lose people. You're going to think you're going to lose your respect for people that, that probably doesn't warrant your, don't warrant respect in you anyway. It doesn't even matter because of who they are anyway. But the truth is we have got to preach this word and be strong with this word of God no matter what the situation is. So yes, he had gotten arrested quite a few times. And the funny thing about Paul, watch this, Paul finally did get to Rome in chains. Paul got to Rome arrested. That's how we got to Rome. But remember, one of Paul's major goals was to get the Romans to talk to the high pol political people at that time, like Agrippa, and be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Rome was the place where all roads led. Did you all know that? They made sure that all roads led to Rome. Some of y'all remember back in the 70s, there was a, a DJ on a, a radio station, I believe it was WERD or something like that, 1400. Don the Pressure Cooker Smith, and he used to roll. He used to say, all roads lead to this place. He was talking about all roads lead to that place. Yeah, I see you, Dick. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, yeah. We used to, they, he used to say that all roads. Well, that's where that saying came from because they built every road at that time to lead to Rome because Rome was the hotbed at the time. They pretty much ran all of the area. So if he is, Paul's idea was to get to Rome and get the word to the highest person he can get it to, which he did accomplish. Now, you need to understand now that this word, this Bible, this, this book, that this letter, the idea, the theme of it was the righteousness of God. So uh, th this is important for us because when you read the book of Romans, that's what you're getting from it. And as I'm preaching today, I am not preaching to Rail Courtney. I am not preaching you filling your name. I am not preaching what everybody else preaches. I am preaching what God says from his word. And that is that in God, we are called to be righteous. And being righteous is not my own righteousness because the Bible calls that uh, like filthy rags. He didn't call me filthy rags, but my righteousness is just like filthy rags. Ain't no good. But what is righteousness? Righteousness is simply doing right according to not your righteousness, but according to the way God does things. That's what righteousness is. So here it is. Paul is speaking here in Romans. Let's take a look at it with me here. Romans, the 14th verse. He says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the Romans. That doesn't mean that he owed him a thousand dollars with interest. That does not mean that. What he's simply saying here is I owe you the word. I am a debtor to you of the word. I owe you this word. I owe you this gospel. I am called to give you this gospel. And because I am called to give you this gospel, I'm going to make sure that I get to you to get you this gospel. Are you walking with me? See, this is the reason why he wanted so bad to get to Rome so that he could be able to share because he owed it to him. But Paul did something. You see, in America today, we categorize classes by upper, middle, and lower class. We categorize people by color, whites and blacks and Puerto Ricans, Hispanics and uh, Chinese. We don't do, the, they didn't, didn't necessarily do that then. They did it this way. Take a look here. He says to the Greeks, and to the barbarians. The Greeks were those Hellenistic Jews who understood the Greek culture. They learned the Greek culture so they were refined, as some of them said. Yeah, it was the people that was refined. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Those who, who were refined. But then you had the barbarians. The barbarians who didn't really care to understand the Greek culture. That wasn't their thing. They lived life the way they lived life. Maybe you can call the Greece the, uh, Greece the white collar, and you might can call the barbarians the blue collar. Workers. You know, I don't know. You can figure it out. But then he doesn't stop there. He also says that, uh, uh, take a look here. He says, both to the wise and the. There's another word for that. Y'all know that? That word is foolish. So I didn't come just to give the scripture to the wise. I didn't come just to give the gospel to the wise, but I also came to give it to the foolish. In other words, no matter how much you got in your pocket, 
I'm bringing the gospel. No matter what you don't have in your pocket, I'm bringing the gospel. No matter if you're smart up in your head and you know everything, I'm bringing you the gospel. No matter if you have not a clue what's going on around you, I'm bringing the gospel. I owe every last one of you the gospel, and I won't be ashamed to bring it to you. Don't you worry. Now, watch why, why you say I say that, because keep reading here. He says, verse 15, he says, so in so much as in, in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So if I'm going to preach to the Greeks and the barbarians and to the wise and unwise, I'm also going to go to the tippy tippy top and I'm going to preach to all you all too. And you see, you have to understand, Rome had their issues. Rome had the temples that was not of God. Rome had people who believed uh, uh, pantheistically. Uh, uh, they believe polyth uh, polytheistically, meaning they had more than one God. They believed in trinkets. Uh, they believed in doing certain things uh, to be able to conjure down God and conjure down his blessings. They believed in a lot of things in Rome. And guess what? Because it was Rome, it trickled down to everywhere else. So when Paul mentions here specifically Rome, he says uh, that are in Rome also. He says, I'm preaching to everybody, but I am not forgetting you. Don't think I'm scared. I'm coming to you too. Yeah, that's what he's saying. You don't believe me. That's okay. Just keep reading here. We have to be prepared for the gospel. The Bible says here, I am ready to preach the gospel. I am ready to preach to all these different people. You are all the word, ready to preach in all these different places. And I am going to come preach the gospel. But now I keep saying this word gospel, don't I? But we have to break down this thing just a little bit. I am not trying to be theological with you, but you do need to understand a simple thing. The word gospel means good news. It means good news. That's, that's what it means. You know, so if the, and, and gospel, the word gospel might not have been used as a term in the Old Testament, but they talked about the, uh, the, the good news in the Old Testament, too. All through Isaiah and all this, they talked about the good news. What is the good news? That Jesus Christ is the son of God. What is the good news? That for the wages of sin is death of the gift of God. We're going to come to all that. But there, but there you have to understand that there, the gospel is good news. But now you have to understand that if the gospel is to be called good news, there had to be some bad news in order for there to be good news. You see, there's three different types, types of news. You have the bad news, you have the good news, and you just have the news. How many of you know what student loans are? Yeah, probably all of you all understand student loans, whether it be for yourself or for your children or somebody else. You've heard it enough on television where they're trying to do these different things to relieve student loans. And oh, I pray that they do. Yes, Lord, because yeah, I need to get mine gone. But I want to sh. <laughs> Amen to that. But that's a whole different conversation. The, 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 but I want, you to, I want you to see something. You see, the bad news is you get all these student loans, no matter how much you get, you got to pay it back. You got to pay it back. Whether you finish school or you don't finish school, guess what? You got to pay it back. That's the bad news. Somebody said, that's not bad news. It is when you don't have the money. It is when you've gotten a family. You've gotten 27 children now, and now you got to make sure that the household is taken care of. And how do you pay this back? You can only forbear for so long. You can only defer for so long. So it becomes bad news because eventually they're going to be coming to hunt us down for that money. That's the bad news. Okay? All right. The news, just the news, is, uh, well, let me say the good news. Let me say the good news is this. There is going to be relief. They're going to remove $20,000, $30,000, $40,000. I don't know if they are or not. Don't clap yet because I have no idea what they're going to do. But this is just a, this is just a, a possibility of what they've been talking about. They will relieve. The, you know, the good news is that they will relieve some of that money off of your back. Off, uh, some of the burden off of your back, D. But the news comes this way. I don't have a debt to first. 
I ain't never got student loans. Yeah. Never did. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. It's just news. Right. You understand where I'm coming from, right? You're walking with me. All right? So the bad news is I got student debts. I need some help. The good news is I got the money. I mean, that's going to give me some relief. Just the news is for those who don't have student debt, hey, it's good for somebody. So there, that's the difference between bad news and just news. Now, here's the thing. The Bible says this. The wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is the glory of his eternal life. Here's something else he said. He said these words. He says, for all have sinned. You see, some of you might not have gotten those student loans, but every last one of us have sinned. You see, it might just be news to you if you've never gotten student loans that they're going to give some money back. But for those who are are in this place and outside those doors, oh, you've sinned at some point or another. Yeah, yeah. I don't care if you had the back door. I don't care if you're standing in the pulpit. You done sinned. I said done sinned. That's what I said. So we have to understand this. So that is what the beauty of being of the good news is. And here's the deal. When you're living life, there's always going to be people that are going to look at these things that you're dealing with in life or look at the things they're dealing with in life and say it's just life. Uh, You know what? Uh, This is who I am. You know what? This is what I do. And this is my we have all kind of reasonings and excuses as to the things that we do. And that doesn't matter because that doesn't change the word of God. Okay, so when you walk in somewhere, you might walk into a place that may be totally against something that the Bible says is true. But guess what? You got to be ready to preach anyhow. You got to be prepared to preach that word anyhow. You see, there's no time to be messing around and wondering what you should do and beating around the bush with the words. The Bible says what it says. That is it. That's the bottom line. That settles it. Now, you can have your critics all day long that's going to say, well, that was written 2,000 years ago and it's old and out of date. Remember, the word of God does not change. Well, Pastor, how you know that all that happened? You weren't there. That could have been just somebody writing a book. You know what? You, you might be right. You could be right. That could be the case. But you know what? There's faith in something. You got faith somewhere. I just believe in Jesus Christ. I believe this word is God's. Now, you got to believe, in, and on the other hand, that there is no God. You've got to believe, on the other hand, that Jesus Christ is not God. You've got to believe, on the other hand, that this word is not true. You see, the worst I'm going to get when I die is I'm just going to be dead. But if I'm right, if I'm right, if this word is true, if God is almighty, if Jesus Christ is the son of God, then you got a whole lot more to worry about. At best, I'm going to live a good life because I have a good word to follow, even if it's not true. At worst for you, is that if you die and this is real, oh, buddy, you got to pay for that thing. You see, so I don't mind living this life and believing who Jesus is. I don't, be, I don't mind having faith in that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I don't mind preaching the word of God because it is in my heart. And this is who I'm living for. That don't mean I get it all right. That don't mean you won't catch me doing something I don't supposed to be doing. The difference is I can say, Lord, I have sinned. I have messed up. And he who confessed his sins, the God is faithful and just to forgive of all unrighteousness. You see, that's what I love about it. Doesn't mean I'm going to go out and do all the wrong stuff. God forbid. My goal is to live the way God says to live. However, if I do mess up, I got a God that has already saved me, that has already forgiven me, and I can walk in the forgiveness that he's given me. 
You see, that's the deal here. You see, I want to be given. I want to be ready to give that gospel. That's true gospel right there. That is real good news for somebody. Now, all this full gospel versus not full gospel. Look here. The word is the word. You call it what you want. But if you can't get saved through Jesus Christ, it ain't the gospel no matter what. You know, that's why I love this word. The Bible says these words. He says, I am ready to preach the gospel to you no matter where I am. You know what? I'm going to preach to you right here in right direction. Hallelujah. But if I, can't, if I can't walk out them doors and still preach the gospel to others who I don't know, guess what? I'm not fit to be a preacher. If I can't go down to the corner store and somebody is in need of salvation and I can't witness to them and tell them about Jesus Christ, then I am not worthy to be standing here in a pulpit. I need to be ready in season and out of season. I don't care if you believe this word or not. I can only give you according to what God says and now it's between you and God what you believe or what you don't believe. I am not a magnet to make you believe. Try to pull you to believe it. No, no, no. I am called to give you the word and I'm going to keep loving you after whether you accept Jesus or not. But the scripture goes on on verse uh, on verse 16. He says, for I am not ashamed. I'm ready to preach the gospel and I am not ashamed of the gospel. In other words, what is the opposite of, of shame? Uh, pride, being proud. If you're ashamed of the gospel, that means you're not proud of the gospel. That's nothing bad. You may. The only time you make uh, pride a bad thing is when it's against the word of God. It's as simple as that. No difference if you take yourself and you pride in yourself and the things that you do but look here now you got to deal with God but you can be proud of your word of God God never told you you couldn't be proud of your children God never told you that you couldn't be proud of accomplishments but now when you think you God yourself because you made these accomplishments when you think you have become God of the children that you have well now you got a whole different conversation that you're going to have with God but there is a healthy, positive pride. There is a way that you can be proud. You can be proud of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what the gospel stands for. You see, let me tell you why you had a lot to be proud for. The Bible lets us know that the gospel tells us that the past salvation has been taken care of because the penalties are taken care of. The present salvation has been taken care of because the power of sin has been taken care of. The future salvation has been taken care of because the presence of sin has been taken care of. There is so much to be proud of the gospel for that you should be ready to go out and tell somebody. I love my children enough to tell them about Jesus Christ. I love my family members enough to tell them about what he did on the cross. I love my friends enough to let them know that he died and three days later he got up when the dude was still on the rose and that he is sitting on the right hand of the father. You see I can be proud of the gospel because I love the people around me so much that I want them changed just like I received change that is the beauty of the gospel he says I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ now I didn't say the gospel of derail some of my good news is for me but that's about all this is gonna go no sister Banks you don't want that no my good news lasts for that long. But Jesus Christ lasts yesterday, today, and what? Forever. That's the good news that I'm proud of. That's the good news that I am not ashamed of. So why is it that television uh, evangelists and all these major broadcasts get up now and they want to backpedal on situations and things what the Bible clearly says is wrong. Why? Because they don't want to lose members? Either it's the gospel or your members. Choose which one. Because if you're loving them right, no matter what they, your members got going on, they should want to still stay at your church. You see, they should be at church because you're preaching the gospel. 
I don't like what he said, but you know what? He is a man of God and he does love me. That's what should be happening. I didn't say that you get up here in church and because you proud of the gospel. Now you got to you got to now blast people and you got to put them down and you got to hurt them and you got to be negative toward them. You don't got to do that to tell the truth about what God's word is. It's all about love. Paul, Paul, uh, Paul, uh, John. Peter, every last one of these writers told us how important it is to do in love. But every last one of those writers told us to tell the truth in love. So you can't leave one out without the other. You got to have both. For it is, he says, I am not ashamed of Christ. Why isn't he not ashamed? Take a look at the scripture. He says, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Every part of my life has been saved because of the power of God. That's the reason that I, that I am not ashamed. And yes, Jesus came in the form of a, a person that was a Jew. And yes, he went to the Jew first. Then he went to the Gentiles. So he didn't just, he wasn't, he wasn't prejudiced to one. He gave it to us all. Despite what he is. You see, that's why there is no white religion. That's why there is no black religion. You see, there's no such thing as that. Yeah, they can talk about it, but if there is a such thing, then you probably want to stay away from it. You see, you can't call Christianity a white religion because Jesus himself wasn't white. You can't call it a, a black religion because although there are a lot of black figures in the Bible, it wasn't just to the blacks. We got to be honest about this thing. This has never been, he says, not to just uh, Jerusalem, not to just Judea, not to just Samaria, but you take to Samaria, but you take the gospel all over the world. It was never meant to be for one group of people. So take a look. It says, unto salvation to everyone. Not just your black folk, to everyone, not just your white folk, to everyone, not just the, the, the Spanish, not just the, the Chinese, the Japanese, not just the African, but to everyone who believes. And understand. It, is not, it does not even uh, set, uh, it doesn't even set apart those of uh, the sins that they do. I don't care what you got going on in your life. You can never do too wrong in your life that Jesus will not receive you if you believe on him. And you wonder why I'm proud of the gospel? That's why I'm proud of the gospel. For the scripture goes on, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, according to verse 17. Now, let me stop you here and remind you that now we got a steel deal. We dealt with the preparation being prepared for the gospel. You now know that it's important to be proud of the gospel. You have reason to be proud of the gospel. But now you've got to look at the, the things uh, according to the perspective of the gospel. Now, that's just a fancy word for a point of view. That's all it is. It's nothing fat. No big word. It's just a word meaning a point of view. We've got to look at things according to the perspective of the gospel. You see, we look at what's going on in the world according to Facebook now. We, 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 we look at the, what's going on, the, the perspective of the world according to uh, the news now. We, we look at the perspective of the world according to everything else except for what God himself says about things. We got to look at God's point of view. Well, what is God's point of view? 
Well, the God's point of view is you need some good news. God's point of view is that you have all sin. I sin, you sin, we all sin. That's God's that's the perspective of God's word. The perspective of God's word is that in this life of ours, we are going to die. Because the Bible says it is appointed a man, what? Wants to die and then the judgment. When I was growing up, the preachers in my church used to say, you're going to live once and die twice, or you're going to live twice and die once. That's what it is. You know, the, which is only to mean that, you know what, you're going to live once and then you're going to be born again. That's the second life. And when you die, you're only going to die once and you won't go to hell that second time. That's all it means. This is the perspective of the word of God. That's his point of view. That point of view matters. Yeah, yeah. The, the, some rich folks point of view. He who dies with the most toys wins. That's a point of view. You probably don't want to go with that one. Most of us probably couldn't afford that one. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Some of our point of view is, well, you know what? I'm black, and so therefore everything I do needs to be black. There are even churches that will only, only give the gospel to black people. And there are some churches who are white who will only give the gospel to white people. When are we going to learn? If you're looking for a segregated church in heaven, you are in trouble. Uh, let me go. Excuse me, Peter. What a black folk at? See, you got that guy. Well, where the white folk? Where, where, where are the white people? See that? That's not going to work in heaven. Because then Peter's going to be saying, hold on, you sure you're supposed to be here? Let me... Let me look in this Lamb's Book of Life and see if you really in here. You see, that's the kind of foolery that we're going to be having to deal with up there if we think we're going to go to a segregated heaven. Because that's not the perspective of the gospel. He says to everyone who believes. You see, you've got to understand, in the Old Testament, you see, that was part of the not-so-good news, wasn't it? You see, the Old Testament was ran by the law. And see, the law tells us that we need to follow these rules. How many of them were there? 613. Broken down to what? Ten commandments. What's the five? Five for God and five for man. That's how it's broken down. And you have to get them all perfectly. If you want to go to heaven without Jesus. Can I get a show of hands of somebody who might be on the road of having them all right? Nobody yet? About the closest one is the little baby right there on, on, laying on her mama. That's about the closest one right now. Give about another couple, two or three years. Because it never ceases to amaze me how you don't have to talk babies into lying. You don't have to talk babies into pro being prideful or being greedy or anything else. You don't got to talk them into it. It's just part of them. Why? Because the Bible says we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. I know it. We don't like to hear it, but it's true. In other words, just when you think you're perfect, you're lying to yourself. You see, the law really was just to help us understand we can't do this thing by ourselves. The law was to help us understand we don't have the power it takes to do it. But according to this scripture that I just read, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Why am I not of ashamed of the, of the gospel of Christ? Because I have too much to be proud of. I have too much that I can be thankful for. Too much I appreciate from the gospel. Why can I uh, not be ashamed? Because of the fact no matter what sin I've done in my life, no matter what the world sees when they look at me. Jesus Christ saw me well enough to feel like I'm worthy to receive salvation. That's a blessing to me. You see, when I came up, I was poor. Y'all know my saying. I couldn't even afford the O and the R on the word poor, so I was just poor. That's what I was. 
You see, some folk look at me and they say when they was when I was growing up, they say, you ain't going to be nobody. They didn't understand that I had a rough life growing up. So all they saw was somebody that wasn't going to make it nowhere. You don't have a mind in your head. You ain't smart enough. So you ain't going to get anywhere. You see, this is the way people look at me when I was growing up. But Jesus... Jesus said, no, 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 no. It doesn't stop right there. You see, they don't have the last word. They don't have the last perspective. Their point of view means jack, if I can say that in the pulpit. The truth is, my point of view matters, and you are still worthy. I am still going to, I have already died for you, and you are worthy of eternal life. All you just need to do is accept it. That is the Father that I love. That is the father that I serve. That is the God that has brought me from that muck and miry clay to uh, standing on the feet of his word knowing that I can see Jesus one day. I don't have to wonder am I going to see Jesus. I don't have to think I might see Jesus. I can know that I know that I know that I'm going to see Jesus in heaven. I can know that I know that I know that I'm saved. I don't have to have just a mere wish, but I believe that I and I know that I'm going to see God. Why? Because that's the gospel. That's the gospel that I'm not ashamed of. That's the gospel that has been blessed with me because I, my bad news, was ahead of the hell. But Jesus Christ plucked me out and now I can see Jesus one day. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. No matter what this world has to offer, it is never enough. No matter how good whatever you are doing, if it's outside of God, it is not enough. I know because I, in my life, thought it was enough. And it wasn't enough. I can promise you that this life of ours... It's going to end one day. And either you're going to, all of us are going to see God. I'm going to tell you that now. Don't you be fooled. I, yeah, somebody say that you want to know the Bible lets us know in Revelation that we all go through judgment at some point or another. We're going to see it. So don't think you won't. You will be privileged. The question is will you stay with him? The only way you're going to stay with him is through Jesus Christ. The only way you're going to stay with him is receiving his love, receiving his, his grace, receiving his death, burial, and resurrection, knowing that he will change your life. And for you that thinks, well, you know what, I could get saved, but I'm, I, I could get saved, but I, I'm just afraid I'm not going to be able to change tomorrow. It's going to, look, your God ain't never told you to change tomorrow. He said to receive him today. He'll let the Holy Spirit within you at that point work on you to get you better. Some of us, it takes a transformation that might take years, and for some, it might take tomorrow. But you can't worry about that part. You do the one thing he said to do, and that's receive him as your Savior. Will there be one today to receive Jesus as your Savior? Will there be one? You know, some of us, you all say we, we, we were getting saved. I want you should receive him as your Lord and Savior. Let me tell you something. You don't know him well enough to know him as your Lord yet. Get saved. Receive him as your Savior. And the Lord will, the seeing him as Lord will come. Walk in it. Will there be one? It may be someone who is looking for a church home. And you're looking for some a church that will preach the gospel no matter what. Well, you got one right here. Come on down and receive our, our right hand because we're ready to receive yours.